So these schools were initially founded by the European settlers that came over. Yeah, and you know they were they were American by then. You know, like the the folks that that started Harvard, I wouldn't consider them like European. You know, because they were they they left Europe. You know, they didn't want to go back to Europe. But slowly but surely, Yale and Harvard, yeah, they kind of became what Oxford and Cambridge are. You know, obviously Oxford and Cambridge are much older and more prestigious. Huge, huge long histories there. But Yale and Harvard, yeah, they've kind of uh, towed that line rather than, you know, distinguishing themselves as an American institution. I mean, even during the Revolutionary War, uh, the British troops decided not to destroy Yale University. They could have. They were standing right there at the, you know, in New Haven. They, they, there was a battle. They invaded New Haven. They killed some people. And they looked at Yale and they said, no, this is too pretty. We'll just move on. This is too pretty. What kind of war general says, no, this is too pretty? That's ridiculous. To me, it seems like there was something going on there where they said, no, this is a strategic importance. If we lose this revolutionary war, we have allies at this school that can help us win the next war. And they tried to do that. It's called the War of 1812. The British came back. They're like, we're going to fight you again. You know, and now we're apparently allies with them. And I'm not saying, you know, I'm. I'm anti England or anything. I think England's a great country. I know you both are there right now, I'm pretty sure. So I'm not, you know, no hate on England at all. But I think that people need to understand politically the, this time between the 1500s and the 1800s. We take for granted the, the history that we're given. So much happened that has been just kind of left to the side. They're like, yeah, that happened, but you know, it didn't really affect anything else. I just I think that there's a lot of manipulation in the the telling, the retelling of history, you know, and I'd wonder even like what kind of disparities we'd see if we compared like uh an English history education to an American history education and like what events you focus on in an English, you know, school, let's say grades one through 12, right? Not college or anything like that, but grades one through 12, just the difference propagandically, psychologically, what they're talking about. I think there's a difference. I, I don't know because I haven't been uh, across the Atlantic, but it definitely feels like there's some political, um, there's, there's political sort of hangups from that time period that are still affecting politics today. Uh, things like land, rights, things like, you know, sovereignty and the, the treaties that were made with various Native American groups. All of these things have been swept under the rug because they don't want to, they don't want to deal with the truth, the repercussions of, you know, seeing these, these uh, 100, 200 year old crimes with a modern perspective. I think they want people to kind of forget that, that all that stuff happened you know, and it's like, no, we won those battles. Don't go back and rewrite the rules. You know, the rules were the rules back then. That's how it was. We can't turn back and change the past, which I don't think that we should. But I, I do think that there are some things that need to be acknowledged. And, and maybe well, there's a lot we can learn from history, right? Yeah. Well, and especially, you know, with the Native Americans, I mean, you know, African Americans getting reparations. I don't personally agree with that. I know there was like this whole thing about that in San Francisco and but people from Native American tribes, if anybody in the United States deserves reparations, it's them. I mean, they to this day are still living under military oppression. Like maybe people outside the United States don't know this, but Native Americans live on military bases. They don't get to like buy a house and, you know, live their own life like normal people. They live in a, on a military base and they're provided housing, they're provided certain things. But a lot of times these neighborhoods that they live in are just shit, you know, full of crime, full of alcohol, drugs. I mean, you look at like the Apaches, these people who were once, you know, great, like they could survive in a desert. They could survive in a place where there's barely any food and thrive and they've been taken off their their ancestral land and now they're just like dogs in a cage i mean it's really sad to mm -hmm. to think about but it all started with 
New England. It all started with groups like Harvard and Yale because the first Christian missionaries to sort of try to uh, Christianize the Native Americans were from Yale University. They started a, a missionary school called the Stockbridge Missionary School in Massachusetts. And during the Revolutionary War, all the Native Americans who had joined their side and said, all right, we'll believe in the Bible. We'll do your thing. We'll live in your cities and do this thing. They all got turned into prisoners of war. So it's like, okay, we trusted you. Now we're your enemy. You know, even though we surrendered and said we're on your side, they, they were still the enemy. And they all got put on some freezing island and off the coast of Massachusetts and died. You know, and so this is how Native Americans were treated from the beginning of the country, not just in the 1800s when the treaties were being written and the buffalo were being killed. From the beginning, the Native Americans were sort of politicized by the intelligentsia of the day and made to be like this sort of pariah, like, oh, they don't believe in our God, so they don't, they're not worthy of this land. Let's kick them out. And if they convert to God, well, then they can stay. If they don't convert to the Bible in our ways, well, then they have to go. And this is, I mean, this is the sort of, you know, this is how America got started. The, the land of the free, home of the brave, land of religious freedom. And, you know, the, the original inhabitants were all told, if you don't convert to Christianity, you're, you're done so. I mean, this is the kind of thing that we're not taught in school it's because of groups like Skull and Bones, which standardized the education system about 110, 20 years ago, removed all the stuff that made them look bad and, and left this propaganda for us to just sort of sift through and get you know, confused on. I mean, a lot of our history that we're told about America revolves around battles and wars, and there's so much more than that. There is so much more than just battles and wars, you know? I mean, if you looked at the average high school history book, you'd think that people were born with a gun in their hand. It's so violent, you know? And that's just not the case. It's, it's, a, lot more, um, it's a lot more endearing and, and human, like life-inspiring when you actually like, kind of sift through what people back then were saying. Like, here's an example, Thomas Morton was a man who came over to America for religious freedoms. He was a pagan in Europe, you know, when pagans were not really that popular at all. And uh, he came over to the Massachusetts. He founded a little colony that he called Marymount. And uh, he became the enemy of his friends that were, you know, also European because he decided he wanted to trade with the Native Americans and he gave them guns and all this stuff. And uh, that was, you know, considered a really bad thing to do because the colonists were afraid that the Native Americans were just going to, you know, come and kill them all, which sometimes that did happen. Uh, and here's Thomas Morton giving them guns. They're like, hey, man, like we only have one advantage over these people. You know, they can't build guns and you're selling them guns. What the heck are you doing? You know, and, and this is somebody, again, like he's at a time when most people were afraid and would never leave the, you know, confines of their little villages because they were afraid of the wilderness and the scary Native Americans. This guy was like, nah, we're all cool. I'm going to sell them guns. They're going to teach me which animals and plants to forage and kill and hunt for. And, you know, and it was a pretty, pretty good even exchange up until, you know, when the colonists came and burned down Thomas's house and kicked him out of town, you know, it just, and the, the worst part is, is Thomas Morton was a, was their prisoner and they're starving. And he's like, well, you, you guys burned down my house. You, you destroyed all my stuff. I could have cooked for you. I could have hunted for you. You know, it's winter. You guys are going to starve. Why don't you give me a gun and I'll go hunt. I'll go get some food for all of us. So the rich people in town were like, yeah, go for it. So he comes back and he had just enough for some people to eat, not everybody to eat. So he's like, all right, I'm going to go back out and get another 
deer and the rich people they're like no you're not go back to prison we have our food and everyone else in town starved the rich people were able to eat and they put him back in prison so this is the kind of socioeconomic dynamic that's been ingrained in american culture the haves versus the have-nots elite sort of the upper class uh takes its you know whatever it wants and the lower class suffers i mean this is something that it's not unique to america it happens all over the world but it's definitely something that goes against this american dream that we're all given um and i'm not you know trying to be nihilistic and say there is no american dream i think there there has been there was but it definitely it, it's built on a bunch of lies and i think yale and harvard are part of that they're like these propaganda machines and because people benefit from being a part of it you know it's not something that's very likely to be exposed because you know, why would you turn against the thing that made you a millionaire why would you turn against the thing that made your life set you know these people they go and they get a doctorate or a law degree from one of these schools they're not they're not going to turn against the school right so I think enough of en enough people are put through these institutions to protect it from suspicion or from you know people maybe seeing what's really going on, and that that is this is sort of like an intelligentsia uh, control system. Like they're controlling who isn't who gets to the point of changing, right? Like who can reach that point of changing the future changing society we're going to decide it's not going to happen organically anymore it's not going to happen randomly colleges are meant to take those natural drivers of society and to um sort of suspend them in this sort of artificial matrix so that any innovation that happens happens for the system and not for humanity I think that's one of the big problems with the university system and the college system. And I'm not anti-education, not at all. Uh, I think everybody deserves an education. Uh, but I, I do think that the educations that are being given at some of these schools are warping people away from A, the truth, and B, uh, a healthy future for the majority. I think what we're heading towards, if we let these schools sort of manage humanity is a is a healthy future for a very small minority of people and that's the people that have the money to afford it while everyone else is you know being used as a as a slave i mean uh, most people aren't aware of the fact that they're a slave but they're a wage slave we're all wage slaves in these capitalist countries um you know it's a little more obvious in a place maybe like china um where your sort of you know your money is gone it goes to the government at least that's what we're told i mean i've never been to china so who knows it could be you know all propaganda and they're living a great life over there but uh but yeah it definitely feels like harvard yale and these ivy league schools are a part of managing society from the top down and we can't count them out when we look at the world and we say there's all this war there's all this starvation there's all this poverty who's to blame for that ask people ask yourself really who's to blame for that if not harvard cambridge oxford and yale these institutions that claim to be the most achieved the best the peak of human intellectuality yet they're letting the world crumble to pieces I don't think that's because they're foolhardy. I don't think that's because they're just screwing things up. I think that's because they've presented a world to us that fits an agenda, okay? They've presented a world of choices that are managed from the beginning to lead down a certain desired result. So you have A, B, and C choice, little Johnny, pick whatever you want uh but ultimately you know a b and c were 
pre-decided and pre-manufactured based on you know where that would lead you so 